Well, hello everybody and welcome to the Certificate of Cloud Security Knowledge Overview. What we'll cover today is a little bit on what is cloud and cloud security, why should it be important, the history of CCSK, so where is it coming from, a little bit of a dive into the security guidance and body of knowledge, talk about the CCSK certification and exam, how the CCSK is actually being used in the real world, and a part of that is assurance in the cloud chain. And finally, we'll talk about how to get certified for CCSK. A little bit about me. I'm one of the world's most experienced independent cloud trainers. I've delivered cloud training to hundreds of students uh, worldwide. I am a certified trainer for CCSK. Uh, did 26 CCSK trainings and counting. We hope to add about a dozen this year again. I wrote a couple of other uh, cloud courses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I worked at the consulting, at an internet provider, at the service providers, uh, system integrators, and I have a PhD from the university. I'm also on the CSA Dutch uh, chapter board. So cloud adoption in uh, IT is unavoidable. Uh, maybe a shock to some people, but I think and I'm pretty sure that it's unavoidable. The majority of businesses uh, is already using some form of cloud computing. The ones that are using cloud computing um, are seeing increase of usage of applications. So that's really uh, unavoidable. It's, this, this is happening uh, as we speak. At the same time, we see that security is listed as the number one obstacle to cloud adoption, and probably for, for good reason. Cloud computing is really a form of outsourcing with uh, very specific characteristics. And these characteristics uh, have a very important impact on, on security effects and the management of risk and the security posture. And, uh, for example, any responsibility around uh, security and risks is not totally your problem or the provider's problem, or if you're the provider, their problem. We also talk about shared and flexible resources, which give uh, new opportunities, and every opportunity gives new risks. Cloud computing also has ubiquitous access, at least in principle, and that brings its own opportunities and risks, et cetera, et cetera. So what we see is that you know there's a lot of car a lot of new stuff in cloud, a lot of characteristics that make it really valuable, and at the same time, those very same characteristics lead to new risks uh, that should be handled. It's not your daddy's data center anymore. Uh, this used to be the way we ran IT, uh, in a big fortress uh, behind solid walls with a very, very thin connection to the outside world. That's not what IT looks like these days. In the new world, as we speak, uh, in principle, everything's connected one way or another. And one of the consequences of that is that the historical way of handling IT security, which is infrastructure-based, is no longer sufficient. And we need to worry about, need to think of new ways of handling security risks. And we'll see a couple of them uh, later down in this presentation. Now, what's the real world look like with the people that I speak in my training? Uh, I get to see a lot of people that work at banks and other companies. I'm singling out banks because they seem to have the highest compliance requirements. And our number, number one question uh, runs around the following uh, topics. They say, well, we see a lot of vendors pushing cloud solutions, not necessarily, not necessarily for core applications, but for a lot of implications, applications that are relevant to all those organizations. At the same time, business units just you know, pull in cloud uh, solutions all the time from anywhere, basically because they could, and they probably do that because they find a need for that. And a lot of people that work in banks uh, or in other organizations uh, think to themselves, okay, how do we understand what we need to do in terms of risk management? Uh, what kind of a controls need to be applied? And how do we make sure that it is done? And historically, all those controls were run on your own infrastructure, but that's no longer sufficient. Uh, it's no longer your infrastructure, and it's no longer sufficient to just look at the infrastructure. So, uh, in a lot of industries, a compliance also forces uh, people to pay attention to what these risks are. 
Now, a bit of an overview and a, maybe a new way of looking at who is in control and in information technology. One way of looking at it is basically a stack of things. So let's start at the bottom. At the bottom, we basically have racks, power, ping, and pipe, you know, where you know, the electricity, connectivity, and cooling is used to be able to, to rack and stack servers, which is the next layer up in building out your infrastructure. Now, from the perspective that I look at it, this includes virtual machines that run on these and a management plane to, to manage that. You don't want to manage a thousand servers by pushing each individual switch. That doesn't really scale. On top of that, we run operating systems. On top of that, we run grid software, uh, application development environments, um, hosted programming languages, what have you. There's a ton of things out there. And then we start to get into some application code, application service components, either fairly smallish, like a Google Maps API, or a more um, application-specific platform like uh, forest.com, or even very specific vertical services like uh, payment services. On top of that, we actually run the applications that business users find worthwhile to pay money for, but we're not done yet. Um, on top of that, we have application stores and service catalogs, and all this is required to run a proper enterprise. Let's not forget that every application, even if it's a uh, very self-service, still needs some kind of service desk, if only for control and incident management. And then, of course, there's users. Different users have different policies. And large enterprises have a different control requirements than, than small and medium enterprises. Now, the question is, who runs it? Uh, if you're really on, on the uh, far, uh, well, it depends on what you say. If you're on the far left of this picture, then basically you're saying, well, we run it all. But you could also say, well, we run all our stuff. We put it in somebody else's uh, data center. That's what we call co-location. But we could also say, well, let's let's forget about running the virtual machines. Um, let's, have, let's, let's have somebody else do that. In that case, you would be deploying infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service. And if you also outsource your everything, basically, including the service desk, then that's what, what, what's called traditional outsourcing, where you would move your stuff over, lock, stock, and barrel to an outsourcing company. Now, that's no longer a totally popular model, but it, it was there. And instead of it being either, you know, total, totally in-house or totally outsourced, cloud computing gives us these new opportunities in between. And that gives us a couple of, uh, let's say, complications, to put it mildly. Because this gives us new boundaries, new demarcations that we did not have before. Uh, and this, you know, the, the demarcations that separate suppliers from, from consumers. And these new demarcations um, impact people's jobs and roles. Uh, they impact security responsibilities. And as a matter of fact, they uh, create entire new ecosystems. An example question around around the um, demarcation of responsibility. Pretty simple question. Who is responsible for patching the guest operating system in an infrastructure as a service, a service model? Is that the infrastructure provider? Is that the vendor of the operating system? Is that the uh, infrastructure consumer? Or is, the or is the cloud auditor? Well, people get this wrong, uh, although if you study this a little bit, then it, the answer should be fairly obvious. It's the infrastructure as a service consumer who is responsible for patching the guest operating system. The infrastructure provider is not in a position to do that, and you don't actually want them to, to patch that. So as I said, we, we have different, uh, as we move up the stack from, from housing all the way to uh, software as a service, we see uh, new rules, or so we see the same rules, but they're they're um, split in different uh, companies. So if you outsource your software as a service, then a lot of the data center management is done through the SaaS provider. 
And you have to make sure that they do the right security controls on that data center, that not just anybody can walk into that data center. So the essence of cloud security is who does what. And an example that's also worked out in a little bit more detail in, in a CCSK training course is incident handling. Okay, there's an incident. Okay, there's a virus on the storage at your infrastructure provider. Well, who should fix that? Uh, we find an empty admin password on uh, on the server instance, so everybody can log in. Who needs to fix that? We have the heart bleed bug. Um, who needs to fix that? That's actually a pretty hard one uh, that, because that's a spread responsibility. I know whose problem it is. It depends on the demarcation that you've chosen. If you go, if you dial it all the way to the left, you know it's uh, basically your problem. If you dial it all the way to the right. It's basically somebody else's problem, and you just have to make sure that they actually handle it. And the wrong answer to this question, the question, whose problem uh, is it, leads to risk, non-compliance, and loss of business. So that's bad. You need to get the, the answer straight, and then make sure that the, that the, the job is done. So... A lot of problems around cloud security, a lot of, and everybody's fairly aware of that, uh, but there's a lot of FUD around it, you know, and uncertainty, doubt, uh, haze. So that's why the Cloud Security Alliance was founded in 2008. It was a bunch of people who got together, first on the LinkedIn group and then in, uh, in real life, who said, well, we need some best practices to figure out how to provide the right security assurance within the cloud computing arena and to educate people on, on doing that. Well, a couple of years later on, there is a thriving community there. There's a couple of conferences every year. Um, I go to most of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, there's really, uh, these are the guys who know it all. You know, th th These are the guys that get top-notch people to their conferences uh, who use cloud computing in, you know, in Fortune 500 companies. As a matter of fact, in the last a conference, um, one guy came up and said he was from Walmart. He said, well, we're actually a Fortune 1 company. I thought it was bragging, but he was right. So the CSA leads volunteer efforts to uh, produce these best practices documents. And the most well-known document, the most important document, is the security guidance for critical areas of focus in cloud computing. We typically call that the security guidance. At the same time, a couple of years ago, the European Network Information Security Agency uh, produced a uh, document with a similar scope, which is called Cloud Computing Benefits, Risks, and Recommendations for Information Security. And this we basically call the ENISA document. And together, these documents uh, are a broad foundation of knowledge around cloud security. And the topics range from technical ones to very to architecture ones to, to governance ones, compliance. It's pretty broad. Uh, and even a couple of years after writing, uh, this still stands as a fairly substantial and relevant uh, body of knowledge. Uh, there is no charge for getting these documents. You can basically download them for free. So now we're getting closer to the CCSK Certificate of Cloud Security Knowledge. The body of knowledge aims to facilitate the common understanding of cloud security concepts. And we'll get back to that in a, in, a, in a moment. It's not just this is the way to do it, but it's also these are the concepts that are relevant. So if we talk about them in the same way, we should increase the quality of risk decisions that we make around cloud security. The body of knowledge is actually divided in 15 domains, and I will briefly touch upon some of them in this webinar. And the exam uh, has questions for each of those domains. The, the body of knowledge represents or reflects some, some history, uh, some evolution. So the domains overlap and cross-reference at various points. Um, and that makes it you know, somewhat, uh, you know, that's a structure that shines through a bit. Uh, but all in all, it's a very solid body of knowledge. Now let's take some of the example domains in the... Uh, uh, body of knowledge, domain four, compliance and audit. It elaborates on compliance obligations and how these can be validated by audits. And it lists the sources of compliance obligations and how, the, how they could be treated. An example question that is on the CSA website, and that is, uh, let's say, um, 
well, similar questions could be on the exam, is what is the most important reason for knowing where the cloud service provider will host the data? Well, the, from the compliance perspective, uh, the magic word here is where. And uh, the reason for that is that that implies uh, wh what kind of local regulations are uh, applicable to the particular service provider. Of course, that's not the only thing that matters, but it is uh, a pretty relevant one. Domain six, I'm jumping one uh, or two, is about portability and interoperability and some considerations that are that become relevant when a company uh, uses multiple cloud solutions and, and components. An, an example question would be, so why is the size of data sets a consideration when you consider portability between cloud service providers? Now let's reflect on that a little bit. So what changes if the size of your data set changes? And we're not talking about a couple of megabytes here and there. We're talking about, you know, gigabytes, terabytes, maybe even petabytes. And what happens at the petabyte scale is that the time to transfer that data over a data communications link becomes very significant. Even though the internet backbone is, uh, you know, pretty fast, uh, it's still not at the speed that you can move petabyte size data sets in a, in a couple of minutes. So that's something that you should be worrying uh, about. Domain A discusses uh, service management around data centers. And the uh, sample question uh, is or more relevant to that environment than to service management, I suppose. And it says, in which type of environment is it impractical, impractical to allow the customer to conduct their own audits, which makes it important that data center operators uh, should provide some auditing for those customers. Now, this is a little bit of you know, leading the witness type of question, um, because the answer is that it's a multi-tenant environment. So if you have multiple customers, then it gets very impractical to have each of those customers uh, conduct their own audits in the data center. That actually does not make the data center much safer. Uh, it's actually a security threat to have all these auditors around. So that's the kind of thinking that you should be doing. And it has strong implications for the way that you write contracts and uh, provide assurance. A little bit more of a technical domain, uh, uh, domain 13, virtualization. It describes the risk that virtualization, especially uh, virtual server technology, brings. And the sample question is, okay, why do blind spots occur uh, in a virtualized environment where network-based security controls may not be able to monitor certain types of traffic? So the whole idea here is that if you monitor all traffic between your servers, then you might discover data that's leaking out of your systems or illicit usage of the network and stuff like that. And that's a security control that is very infrastructure centric, and uh, which is one of the reasons why it's no longer working. Why is it not working? Well, because a lot of that network traffic actually occurs within the physical server, within the hypervisor. So if you look at the physical network, you don't even see that traffic because it could stay within the virtual um, within the hypervisor. So that's a new kind of you know, risk where an existing control is no longer very uh, effective. Then domain 14, interesting domain, um, I think myself, uh, although it, I think it should be moved to a different domain, but that's a different story. It describes opportunities and concerns that you have when you use cloud services for implementing security controls. In, in a way, it's turning this around. A couple of years ago, we said, well, cloud's not as secure as in company IT. And that is past a tipping point because in-company IT has not become much more safe or secure. Um, in the contrary, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you look at all the data breaches in uh, last year, then you'll see that a very, very, very significant part of that, or basically all of them, occur in in-house IT and not in cloud providers. And uh, cloud providers are getting better and better in doing their job. As a matter of fact, cloud providers can bring you security functionality that you find hard to do yourself, like DDoS prevention or email filtering at scale. Okay, so the question then becomes, when we deploy security as a service in a highly regulated industry, uh, 
what should the parties, the consumer and provider, agree on in advance and include in a service level agreement. Now, the reasoning here is that a highly regulated industry, where you would have like PCI DSS standards and payments cards, would have strict requirements on the type of security controls that you do and would force you to report on the effectiveness of those controls, which means that if you outsource those uh, security controls, that you should make sure that any reports that you expect from them are still being provided by the security as a service provider. So that will be the answer there. Well, there's a, a couple more domains, but we'll skip that for a moment. And let's talk a little bit about the CCSK exam, the practicalities. The whole purpose of the CCSK exam is to test for the candidate's understanding of the body of knowledge. It is a multiple choice exam that you can take online and it's uh, timed, which means that you know you have 90 minutes to complete that. And in the 90 minutes, you have to answer six mul 60 multiple choice questions. Uh, some of them are you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, some of them require a little bit more thinking and you should um, correctly answer 80% of the questions uh, to, uh, to pass the score. Um, because it's online, you can take it in your own environment. It is actually open book, but you know, there's no way that you can actually figure out the uh, answers to these 60 questions in uh, 90 minutes. There's no way that you can actually do it that quick. Fortunately, which is pretty unique, uh, you get two tries. So if you fail the first time, you, you, you will understand what type of questions there are, and you will be able to fine tune your studying for that. Although I've seen people who fail it twice because, uh, but, but that was because they refused to open the book to check on the final questions. And my last training, uh, I got people score 88, 92 percent, uh, so they really uh, pass. The other thing about the CSSK certification is that there's no maintenance. There's no no requirement for you to um, to keep up with it, uh, which is uh, I think pretty um, which is different from like IRC Square training. Now, how useful is the uh, CCSK? Well, there's a couple of dimensions that I want to uh, discuss here. First of all, it's about individual competence, and then it's about uh, facilitating team communication, and finally, uh, it is about uh, supporting assurance in the entire cloud supply chain um, and the collaboration between provider and consumer. So first of all, for individual certification, thousands of, of IT and security professionals have, have obtained this already. I have personally trained a couple of hundred uh, of them, but I know that a lot of people do this uh, you know, uh, around the world and with self-study. And I'll get back to the uh, consumer vendor discussion. And the other interesting one is that uh, CIO.com uh, lists uh, CCSK as the number one in their list of top 10 cloud computing certifications. So that's a very uh, good uh, recommendation, I would uh, say. What I also see uh, happening is that uh, entire teams go through this training, and that has a number of interesting advantages, and, and you know, there's a lot of interesting outcomes of that. And I have done a couple of these uh, as in-company trainings, and it's interesting to see what happens there. Because if these people will go through the training together, they have a more common understanding of, uh, of the security concepts. And the result is that they will uh, be on the same page when they discuss uh, these topics. They will uh, be able to bridge the uh, diversity that they bring to the uh, situation. And the diversity is actually strengthening the um, how would I say, the, the diversity is actually strengthening the quality of their risk decisions. The, uh, the way it also works is that a decision process will go faster because good ideas get accepted uh, quicker and bad ideas get killed more quickly. So overall, their decision processes speed, speed up and there's less, less time wasted on, on all kinds of discussions. I've seen this happen at a bank, at a software company, at a government organization, and, uh, and a few more. The, another use of the CCSK body of knowledge is in the cloud controls metrics. The cloud controls metrics is a security and compliance control framework that actually matches the, the security guidance very closely. So there's almost a one-to-one -one mapping between the 
controls that are in the CCM and the, and a specific chapter or domain in the body of knowledge. The CCM also uh, cross-references multiple frameworks like PCI DSS, uh, ISO 27001, HIPAA, and uh, that makes it for that makes for an uh, easier or use in, in any assurance uh, situation. Then it's uh, the final thing is that it's actually um, the basis for a certification of providers that's called STAR for Security Trust Assurance Registry. I won't have time to dive deeper into that, but this is really a very promising approach uh, towards cloud provider uh, assurance. So how do you study for CCSK? Well, uh, of course, the simple way to do it, and, and actually people um, are doing that, is just study the documents and learn how to, uh, pre to uh, acro acrobat through the PDF, to control F through the PDF, uh, so that on your online, um, uh, when, you, when you do the exam, you actually learn uh, that when you do the exam, you can actually find the uh, hard questions. Depending on how much you know already, this can take a couple of hours to uh, uh, really multiple days of study. Now, once you've done the studying, you might want to check out your exam questions, um, some sample exam, exam questions. Unfortunately, there are not very many. I'm in the process of uh, expanding that set of exam questions. Uh, but uh, it's not out there. There's a couple of sets out there, but they're pretty outdated. Then, of course, uh, you could consider taking a uh, course to help you study through it. And the advantages of the of courses are, are manifold. Uh, for example, uh, you learn how to apply this to your own work better. You discuss with other participants, and the chances of passing the test are significantly higher with uh, with the course. So. Um, if you want some practical background, then uh, you can visit uh, one of my sites at www.clubcloudcomputing.com. There's a membership site out there that you can uh, visit, and uh, there's some more that well, we'll talk about a bit later. So if you're interested in a class, then I suggest that you uh, enter your location preference at uh, www.ccsk.eu. Uh, on the short run, we have uh, a virtual CCSK training coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, that's probably going to run because we already have some signups for that. Um, in that virtual training, uh, I break up the material in a couple of uh, shorter sessions, so it's not a full day, but it's multiple days with uh, sessions of one to two hours. We'll probably be running a CCSK class in Dubai, uh, in the Middle East, in the Gulf, uh, from uh, March 31 to April 2, um, another one uh, one or two weeks later in Utrecht, my, my hometown, and there are some more opportunities coming up uh, in Dublin, London, Paris, Oslo, and really if you sign up to www.cssk.eu, you will find the, uh, the dates and I will actually keep you uh, updated on that. And with that, uh, I basically uh, uh, say bye, goodbye for now and I'll hope to see you soon.